welcome. I'm excited to see everybody here. Um, and we're talking about my favorite topic, which is bugs and conservation and the why behind conserving insects and spiders and other, um, other bug friends in the landscape. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I hate bugs. We don't need those. What if we had a world without bugs? Wouldn't that be great? It wouldn't be so great. And <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about why tonight. And then we'll talk about some of the things that you can do as either homeowners or gardeners or landscapers or whatever else, wherever you live, bugs are important everywhere to all of us. So we'll talk a little bit about more as we go through tonight's presentation. I don't like to spend a ton of time on myself and talking about sort of a lengthy, lengthy bio. What I will say is I'm speaking on behalf of um, chasing bugs and chasing bugs is Sometimes I don't even know what to call it because it's really just like an educational campaign that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, and it's kind of like the umbrella name that I give to all of my work. I do writing. Um, I do a number of other like public speaking and projects and things all kind of under that umbrella of chasing bugs. So as we go through tonight's presentation, I invite you to throw questions or comments into the chat. I will keep the chat open and I will respond to questions as they come in. I'm also happy to leave time at the end if anybody wants to hang out a little bit more and you can pull yourself off of mute and ask questions there and we can have a bit more um, conversation. So with that, welcome, hello. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we are going to just kind of dive right in. But first I do wanna make sure I pull up that chat window so I can see what you're saying as it comes in. So again, we're talking about backyard stewardship and specifically conserving and protecting some of our littlest neighbors, which in this case is going to be insects and spiders and some other bug friends. So first of all, I would invite you to throw this answer into the chat to this question. That is, how do you feel about insects and spiders? I always like to start here. Usually when I'm doing presentations, the people who come to the presentations are um, self-proclaimed insect or spider lovers. A lot of them have a certain affinity for our pollinators in particular, but I would throw that question out to you, Kathleen. I love most of them and find the rest interesting. Lauren says, I love them, every little creature. Yes, great to watch them, very true. Keep those answers coming in. We need them, we do need them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why we need them. In fact, that's our next question. Why do we need insects? So if you have a response to this, again, I invite you to throw that into the chat. Anything goes here. So um, no right or wrong answers. Why do we need insects and spiders? Why are they so important? And what might happen if we had a world without insects and spiders? What do they do for us? <laughs> to keep many things in balance, they make the world go round, right? E.O. Wilson said, um, the little things that run the world is how he described insects. And that is so true. They keep balance. We talk about pollination um, and food for birds. In fact, pollination is um, oftentimes where we start and end the conversation as it relates to insects, which is one of my just personal pet peeves because insects do so much more than pollinate. But as far as conservation dollars and research goes, we tend to give a lot of credit to the pollination role. The reason for that is because we need food to eat. We as humans um, like our diversity of food. We like to have you know colorful fruits and vegetables on our plate. We like to have really easy access to a lot of different foods. And as pollinators decline, we're gonna start losing a lot of our agricultural systems health. And because of that, we tend to just care a lot more about pollination than some of these other roles that they play. But some of you hit the nail on the head. We talk about predation, right? They're food for other things and they themselves eat other things which help keep those food webs in check without the predation of things like wasps and spiders. We would have so many more insect and, and other bug pests kind of roaming around our world. Many insects also contribute to decomposition. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of those roles as we go on. But decomposition cannot be overstated. The importance of decomposition, I should say, um, cannot be overstated because if we didn't have some of these decomposers out there, we would kind of just be living in a world of filth and like dead and decaying, rotting organic material. Um, soil aeration is also a really important role that a lot of our soil dwelling insects and other bugs play. We talked a little bit about food web integrity. 
insects, especially our caterpillars, provide really great food for things like baby birds, right? If we like birds, then we should like insects. If we like fish or reptiles or amphibians or a number of other higher life forms, we have to have insects and spiders out here because they're the ones sort of creating, um, other than our plants at the base of the food chain, our insects create a foundational part of that, that food food chain and food webs. Insects also provide food for us as humans. How many of you have eaten insects before or spiders? Sometimes we see like chocolate covered spiders or um, sometimes um, insect protein is now being like ground up in different things like tortilla chips or granola bars or even protein powder that you can take and put in a smoothie like other protein. Stir fried cicadas, Kathleen, did anybody try uh, cicadas or anything with brood 10 this year? And like all of this, again, I know some people were like frying them up and they said they taste kind of like shrimp. Of course, for anybody who has like a shellfish allergy, that would have been a no-go. I don't personally eat any seafood, nor did I partake in cicadas. But Kathleen, you said you did. And were they good? <laughs> was it delicious? Was it everything you had hoped it was going to be? I still can't bring myself to like the crunch. I, you said it was okay. See, I wouldn't mind taking like insect protein powder and like putting it in a smoothie. I wouldn't mind like with the granola bars and some of the other stuff, but like eating a whole like grasshopper or cricket or ant or spider that just does not sound super delicious to me personally. Um, but 2 billion people across the globe regularly consume insects. They're a really great source of protein and much more sustainable than the protein we get from say things like beef or chicken. So people across the world are looking at um, entomophagy, which is the, the practice of eating insects as a really sustainable food source for a lot of people. We also get a number of byproducts, of course, um, food byproducts and other like uh, silk from spiders or honey from, of course, honeybees. So that kind of gives us a very, very general sense of why these guys are important. Now we're going to kind of go through some of these specific roles and some of the, the insects that support those roles or um, spiders that support these roles. I just kind of wanted to give, uh, and this is such a basic introduction of like a who's who in the insect world, who might you be seeing out there in your gardens or your landscape or your local parks and, you know, what role do they play? Everybody probably knows who this is, right? This is the honeybee. And in the world of pollination, we tend to give so much credit to our honeybee. Why? Because we use them as largely an agricultural commodity. We can pack up their hives. We can transport them across the country to help pollinate our blueberries and our almond crops and a number of other things that we love to eat, right? Apples, things like that. Um, honeybees are wonderful but they are simply an agricultural commodity. They are um, Eurasian, they are non-native to um, America, United States. So when we talk about like pollinator conservation, oftentimes the honeybee tends to come up as like this icon, right? Like, oh, we, we have to protect the honeybee. The honeybee in terms of conservation should not be one of the, the, like the key species that we're focusing on, right? We have so many native species of bees, something like 500 species just here in Ohio of native bees that we should be paying attention to. Um, this is a species of longhorn bee. I don't know the exact species, but it's a longhorn bee. So called that because of the beautiful long antennae here. And you can see all of the hair on this bee's body. They're built for pollination. You see a little bit of pollen here on the hairs on the head. They're built for pollination. This is a digger bee, one of our solitary nesting bees. They nest underground. And you can also see built for pollination, the hair is all over their body. These are the types of bees, these and, and bumblebees and a number of other species of bees. These are the guys that we should be talking about in terms of bee and, and pollinator uh, preservation and protection. An example of one of our sweat bees, it's a metallic green sweat bee. You can see the pollen covering the legs. They're also just beautiful bees. This is just a snapshot of some of my favorite species and some of my favorite bee photos that I've, I've taken here. And there are so many other species here that we should be thinking about. For anybody who might be a little bit fearful of spiders, this is a spider. Sorry if that is very triggering. I only have, I think, two photos of spiders here in the presentation. And I apologize because 
growing up, I hated all insects and spiders, but especially spiders. And even seeing a photo like this of them on a big screen would be very triggering for me. Um, I see Lawrence is so cute. This is actually, this uh, was my pet jumping spider. Her name was Rosie. She sadly passed away not too long ago. She had a brother. His name was Roscoe and he sadly just passed away not too long ago, just a couple of days ago, in fact. But they were my pet jumping spiders. I love jumping spiders so much. I like to call them the, um, the puppy dogs of the spider world. They were my gateway spider to really understanding and, and understanding the role of spiders, but also being less fearful and afraid of them. They are so darn cute. They're fluffy. They've got these big charismatic eyes. Not all spiders, in my opinion, are as cute as our jumping spiders, but all spiders are really important parts of the ecosystem. Now, this particular species, this is a crab spider, and we have a number of species in Ohio. They can be very colorful. Some of them can almost change their colors depending on the actual um, vegetation that they might be sitting on. Look good. They're probably my second favorite spider. Not quite as cute. I don't know if I would call this cute. Um, they do think they're really cool looking. Their eyes, of course, aren't quite so big. I love jumping spiders because their eyes are just so charismatic, but crab spiders aren't quite as cute, but still super beneficial. We often find crab spiders in the garden. They often have prey like little flies or sometimes even art some of our pollinators they might eat, but they're really good predators. Here's a teeny tiny little jumping spider. I think I had three photos of spiders, apologies. Um, here's a teeny tiny little jumping spider, much smaller than Rosie, who was a regal, a species called regal jumping spiders, which is quite large. This one's teeny tiny, but still a great fierce predator in the landscape and wonderful to have. Now, who's, who knows what these are? Anybody who knows bugs probably knows what these are, but these are often called the incorrect name. So I'll give you a second to type that into chat and we'll kind of just assess your insect and bug knowledge here tonight. Flower flies, yes. Yeah. So a lot of people call them flower flies. These are surfid flies, hover flies, flower flies, we often call them. Oftentimes in growing up, we always called these sweat bees, right? Because they are attracted to sweat. So you'll see them hovering, that's our home hover flies hovering around um, if you're like outside a little bit sweaty, um, but they are not sweat bees. You saw a photo of that metallic green sweat bee earlier. These are flies. And in some species, the larvae of the fly are predaceous. They actually prey upon other insect pests, like soft-bodied insect pests, like aphids or other things. So they're really, really great predators. And then in their adult form, like these two, they can be sort of passive pollinators. They're not built for pollination in the same way that like the honeybee or some of our bumblebees are with all that hair, but because they spend their days visiting flower to flower, that's why we call them Lauren flower flies, they do happen to just pick up pollen and they can easily transport it from one flower to the next, helping with, of course, reproduction of those plants. Now, here is an example. We talk about um, predation. We also can talk about parasitism. A lot of our wasp species, and wasps are such a fascinating group of insects. I recently wrote an article for the American Gardener magazine all about why we should care more about wasps. And in my research for that article, I mean, I learned so much that I didn't even know about just the benefits of, of wasps. One thing that I learned was that if you know anything about bugs, you probably know the beetles, Coleoptera, is our largest order of insects in terms of just the sheer diversity and number of species in that order. But there are a lot of people who study, excuse me, things like wasps who are arguing that we actually probably have more species of wasps than beetles or more species of Hymenoptera, so that's our bees, our ants, and our, our wasps, simply because there are so many species of parasitoid wasps out there. There are so many. This guy, you can, or gal, you can actually see she is ovipositing eggs, her eggs, in these assassin bug eggs. So these things that look like little milk jugs, those are eggs of assassin bugs. And then this wasp is laying her eggs inside of those. So her larvae will hatch and they will consume the larvae of the assassin bugs before they ever emerge, which is great because then we have predators in the landscape and assassin bugs, assassin bugs can be great. They're actually their, you know, their own predators and they, um, they eat other things too, but they can also be somewhat damaging to certain crops. Here's another example of a parasitoid wasp, and she is hanging out on a group of brown marmorated stink bug eggs. So some lay their eggs, some wasps lay their eggs in stink bug eggs. And of course, if you know anything about stink bugs, 
um, considered a pest in our homes because they crawl through cracks and get in our house and they do really stink if you ever squish them. Don't make the mistake of squishing them with bare hands because that stench does not easily go away. And it does smell an awful lot like cilantro if you have ever experienced that. A lot of people have just a very like big aversion to cilantro because they think it tastes like soap. Um, but it also can smell like stink bugs. There's a number of reasons why we have aversions to things like cilantro. It's a very fascinating uh, study. But yeah, so these, these wasps will just lay their eggs and other things and then consume those pests before they ever become pests. And that's amazing for us. Wasps are also, they can be passive pollinators, similar to our flies. And this guy, this is the paper wasp, actually probably a girl, are paper wasps, very common, but they're also very beneficial because a lot of wasps, they also eat other insects and they also feed their young insects. So some wasps will actually rip apart prey and bring that like little bits and pieces back to colony for young to eat. Others will bring like whole insects or spiders back to the nest. We have like mud dauber, for example, build these beautiful sort of, or maybe they're, what are they called? I think they're the, the species of mud dauber. They bring back like whole spiders. I have found um, these mud nests before with just stuffed, filled with spiders. And you can see that the spider legs, they're dead, just like hanging out, um, or at least they're uh, paralyzed, just hanging out of these little pipes of, of mud that these wasps, they build, and then they bring these prey back for their young. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Kathleen says more flies. Here, here's another fly. Um, this is our uh, green bottle fly, and they are wonderful decomposers in their larval form. Of course, larvae of these guys are called maggots, and maggots we tend to think of as absolutely disgusting, right? Because we tend to see them on rotting meat or dog waste or animal waste that we find outside or in our trash cans. And yes, they do tend to hang out around dog waste or garbage. That's because they're wonderful decomposers. They lay their eggs in that waste, and then the eggs hatch into little maggots, and the maggots will eat that wonderful stuff. Stuff, but it helps in the decomposition process. So even though we tend to see these sometimes in our house, they tend to be really obnoxious. I think bottle flies are some of the most beautiful flies out there. Their metallic bodies are just wonderful. And their bright red eyes, I think are gorgeous, but they tend to be demonized a lot. We have some other predators too. Again, we're, we're going through kind of a short list here before we get into some conservation tactics, but this is the ambush bug. Really great predator with these long raptorial arm parts that they use to like capture their prey. Probably a little bit reminiscent of praying mantis, which you'll see in just a second. Um, this is an assassin bug nymph emerging from an egg case. It was the first of about probably two dozen or so. Um, this egg case uh, was just kind of a big, a big mashup of eggs. And each one of these little white caps is like a little, it's just like a test tube, like a big bundle of test tubes. And each one has a cap and that little assassin bug nymph kind of came up. When I went to photograph that a couple hours later, there were like dozens of just little white spindly legged assassin bug nymphs crawling around. This is a mantid fly. Again, big raptorial arm parts, uh, similar to that ambush bug. And it uses those to capture prey, very similar to praying mantis here with those wonderful arm parts. We know that praying mantises are wonderful predators. Sometimes they can eat things that you might not expect, like hummingbirds or even frogs or small snakes or other things. So praying mantids can be a little bit um, fearsome in the garden. This guy is a Chinese praying mantis. We tend to have a lot of these. In fact, it's all I've seen in the last couple of years in my area. I haven't seen any of our native, um, our native praying mantises. Dragonflies, also wonderful aerial predators. They can snatch prey right, right out of the air. Fun fact about dragonflies that I learned recently, dragonflies have up to a 95% success rate in hunting. They are literally considered by science to be the most um, successful predator of any animal based on their success rate of catch. So 95% of the time when they go in to catch something, they will successfully catch it compared to something like a lion who, does anybody want to throw out a guess as to how successful, like the success rate for hunting for a, a female lion, like a, a lone singular female lion going out and hunting? How, how often is she successful? What does that percentage success rate look like? Just throw out a guess there in the chat for me. Because I was really surprised to learn this and just the comparison between a lion and a dragonfly. 50% says Mary Ann, 20% says Rosary. It's actually between 17 and 
for a, a sole female lion hunting. Now that percentage goes up to about 30% if that female were hunting in a pair or a pack with some other lions. But think of, it's like mind boggling to see like the success rate of a dragonfly, especially because they're doing that in the air. They're catching their, their prey midair, which I just think is fascinating. I had the wonderful opportunity of participating in my first Mothapalooza event in June. And of course, we have a big mothing week that happens, the, the big moth week, which was like mid-June, and went down to the Appalachian region of Ohio, Southwest Ohio, and we found some amazing moths. Why am I bringing this up? Because what we do know, and this is not, this is an IO moth, this is a sphinx moth caterpillar, so different species, but caterpillars help support things like our birds, right? If we want to have birds in the landscape, we have to have things like caterpillars, and we have to be supporting things like caterpillars through the things that we plant in the landscape. So there is sort of a chain here. We have to support these creatures so that they can go on to support other creatures, and moths honestly are just some of the coolest so again, if you have any questions about kind of that who's in the dance world, please feel free to throw those in the chat and I'll get to those. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about sort of the scope of insects before we jump into the stewardship activities that you can employ at home to help support these guys. So again, we're kind of ignoring spiders in this particular conversation right now. We're going to shift to kind of just talking about insect species. There's about a million species of insects described in the world, but entomologists and scientists estimate that there's about five to 10 million total species out there. It's always just mind boggling for me to think about because that means there are species that quite frankly, we will probably never ever even come to know because we know that insects are in decline and they're probably declining at such a, an advanced rate that we will never know them in our lifetime, right? We will never either find them or they will be extinct before we are able to discover and describe them. Just the sheer number of insects compared to things like mammals or bird species or anything else. It's it's a lot. There's a lot of insects in the world um, and they account for the greatest diver diversity of any other, any other sort of animal species. So that's really important to consider. These guys are really, really important to our ecosystems. Real fast, just to kind of give you a baseline of what types of insects we're talking about, we're going to categorize these into two major groups. We have our hemimetabolous insects that go through what we call incomplete metamorphosis. Oftentimes growing up, like in grade school, I only remember learning about those that go through complete metamorphosis, right? Things like butterflies and moths. I never remember learning about the incomplete metamorphosis insects. These are things like our true bugs, our grasshoppers. This is a Katie did nymph here on the slide, dragonflies and damselflies. These guys have three major um, stages in their life. They have an egg. And this is the egg case of a two, two marked tree hopper. I'm trying to remember the name, two marked tree hopper. Um, these are the nymphs. So each of these little three will grow into an adult that is a, a adult two marked tree hopper. But this is what the nymphs look like. They are similar in form to the adult. So they kind of look like miniature versions, although with a lot of tree hoppers, they do tend to vary in form, but they look fairly similar. You can kind of see like the little horn or the pronotum starting to emerge. They have the six legs. They do not have fully matured wings. So they have these like little tiny wing buds that you can see here, but they do look fairly similar in form. And then this is the beautiful, handsome, adult tree hoppers. And I, if you know me, you know, I love my membrassids. I love tree hoppers so much. I think they're wild and wacky and just wonderful. They don't get nearly enough recognition because it's not like they're out there, you know, pollinating plants. It's not like they're out there, you know, feeding birds, although birds probably do eat them. They're certainly eaten by other insects and spiders, but I just think tree hoppers are fabulous. And if you've never like seen a tree hopper, like just Google it and you'll see just the most amazing diversity of, um, of insects. They're just so fun. So three life stages, the egg, the nymph, those are the juveniles or what I sometimes just call the baby bugs. And then we have the adult stage compared to our holometabolous insects that go through complete metamorphosis. And this accounts for the majority of known insect species. So 
in large part probably because it accounts for Coleoptera and Lepidoptera um, and Hymenoptera, which are pro probably our most studied orders of insect, right? Our beetles, our butterflies and moths, our bees, wasps, and ants. Um, it also accounts for flies, right? So this is where the majority of our insects are going to be. So this is an example of lady beetle eggs. I don't think these are the same species, but I'm just showing you examples of a life form of a lady beetle. So it starts with eggs. There's four life stages in our complete metamorphosis insects. We have eggs. We have larvae. So this is a lady beetle larvae. I like to think that they look like tiny little alligators. A lot of people see these in their gardens. They have no idea what they're looking at. So I tend to um, see photos floating around on Facebook, for example, all the time of people are like, I saw this in my garden. What kind of bug is this? It's just a lady beetle baby. <laughs> and they pupate. So similar to how a butterfly or a moth builds a cocoon and pupates there. This is a lady beetle pupa. So all beetles go through that pupation phase. They kind of stick themselves on some vegetation, in this case, goldenrod. Um, you can kind of see the general form. You can see kind of like the pronotum, pronotum, excuse me, the elytra and sort of the body and the legs under there. And then eventually they're going to emerge as adults. And this is of course our multicolored Asian lady beetle, which is our invasive non-native species we tend to see probably most often in terms of lady beetles here in Ohio. So what we do know based on research, and you've probably seen this in the media, is that insect populations are plummeting globally. There have been some research studies that have basically condensed you know, studies and knowledge from all across the world albeit a lot of those studies have happened in like isolated areas. There's been some studies in Germany. Um, I think there's been some in South America, some in the U.S., including some like lo longitudinal studies of like butterfly populations. I think those were in the U.S. And um, what we do know is that insect populations are declining and we don't exactly know the full extent of it. But this quote was published a couple of years ago in The Guardian, and it said that more than 40% of insect species are declining and a third are endangered. The rate of extinction is eight times, eight times faster that of mammals, birds, and reptiles, which is huge because we're, we, we pay so much attention to mammals, birds, and reptiles and other things, but we're paying so little attention to insects. The total mass of insects is falling by a precipitous two and a half percent per year. And this suggests that all insects could vanish within a century. So this quote came out in this Guardian article. If, if you know about bugs, you probably read this article. People were in like mass hysteria about this. Of course, our agriculture, anybody interested in like agriculture or farmers or anything else was like, oh my gosh, we're going to lose all of our pollinators. We're going to lose our food systems. Everything's going to collapse. Our ecosystems are going to collapse. Um, it was really scary. A bunch of entomologists kind of came out in response to this and said, listen, we can't say that all insects are going to vanish. Like that is way too big of a statement to make considering the, the research study that this came from. Um, but what we do know is that we don't know a lot about what's happening and why. There's a lot of speculation. They said it's still a dire situation. Like we still, like it, it's scary, but it's probably not quite as scary as you're making it out to be in this article. So I've researched, or I've read a lot of research and I have interviewed entomologists about this and they've said like, yeah, it is kind of scary, but we do need to kind of take a step back and understand kind of what's contributing to this. That said, there is a fair amount of, I think, research and, and just scientific study happening around what are these drivers of decline. The first big one is, of course, climate change, which is causing sort of catastrophic chain reactions globally, right, in terms of weather patterns, in terms of things like wildfires and ice cap melt and just changing ecosystems that are driving declines and extinctions, probably far beyond what we as humans even realize and understand because there's just so much that we don't know. We also know that agriculture tends to be a driver of decline for insects in particular because we are applying a lot of pesticides in these spaces and because agriculture has created a lot of habitat loss. So a lot of these are very interconnected issues. It's very difficult to parse these out and call them like an entirely separate issue, right? So agriculture, pesticides, um, again, landscape changes with urbanization. We also have light pollution, which we'll talk a little bit more. And then of course, invasive species, which are coming in and radically changing the makeup of a lot of ecosystems. So I'm trying to think if I've missed anything in here. 
We do also have just habitat degradation, habitat fragmentation, habitat like just destruction, but a lot of that's being driven by agriculture and urbanization. So if I haven't painted a dire enough photo for you, or a dire enough um, picture for you, <laughs> um, that, that probably seems all like really heavy information, especially if you love nature, you love conservation, you're probably like, oh my gosh, that's a really dark, a dark you know, photo of what's happening. And it is, it can be really scary. I tend to be pretty pragmatic, really um, also just kind of optimistic that we as individuals can help. You know, there's, there's so much media attention recently around like the, the top, you know, 10 or top five or top 20, you know, corporations that are contributing to things like global climate change. And I think that's helpful to know because it almost lessens the emotional burden on us as like individuals but it also sometimes lessens our ability to help, or at least our ability to think that we can contribute positively to conservation outcomes. And I think that we should all feel empowered to make reasonable changes in our own lives to help in this regard. And I think that there's real things that we can do. This six, this six item list that I'm gonna talk about here tonight this is not you know, all encompassing. This is some things that we can do to help insects in particular, but there's a lot of other things that we can do to just help you know, the broad conservation um, agenda. So with insects in particular, we're gonna talk about lessening the lawn. We're gonna talk about the importance of native plants and why invasives are so bad. We'll talk about leaving the leaves. There's a lot of educational campaigns around leaving the leaves. We'll talk about flipping the switch on light pollution. And then finally, um, why pesticides are so bad and what we can do about it. I'm gonna do a, a quick time check and we are doing wonderful on time. So let's talk about this idea of lessening the lawn. How many of you live in a home or an apartment complex or wherever you might live? How many of you have some sort of lawn where you live? And it could be a common area. It could be your own personal landscape. But how many of you have lawn like turf grass like grass grass lawn Kathleen says no lawn yes <laughs> I have a lawn and this isn't meant to be like oh you have a lawn like <laughs> I have a lawn too <laughs> um, in large part because I live in a neighborhood that it's just like the thing that we have to do right it's like that unspoken societal standard of having a lawn also because it's a tremendous amount of time and it can be a, a lot of money and energy to take that lawn out and to, you know, replace it with native plants. That's the end all goal for me and my family, but we're not there yet, but we are taking small steps, which again, we'll kind of talk about as we go through this presentation. So here's what we know about the, just the, the landscape of lawn, so to speak in the United States. We have 50 million acres of lawn here in the U.S., most of that comes from residential spaces. So 40%, a huge chunk, comes from residential spaces like homes. We also have 20% that happens or 20% that's accounted for in roadsides. If you ever like, you know, driving down Route 71 or wherever it might be, there, there's just a lot of lawn um, along roadsides. Now, I have seen studies and case studies in particular of places like outside the U.S., that are actually planting their roadsides more with like native plants and pollinator habitat um, because they're like, this doesn't just need to be mowed, like mown lawn because A, gas emissions from the lawn mowers and B, um, time and energy of the people who were making, you know, go mow that space, but also it's habitat destruction. So why don't we replant it and rewild that space with things like pollinator plants or plants that can support insects? That's wonderful. I've also seen, of course, there always has to be somebody playing the devil's advocate. I've also seen people come out and say, why are you attracting these creatures to roadsides where they can easily face mortality from moving vehicles? <laughs> um, so you're always gonna have that devil's advocate side, but I think the more we can plant in spaces like roadsides, the better. And we're seeing more and more, I think, institutions and organizations exploring those possibilities too. 
So of those lawn um, acres, only 3% is in golf courses. So not a tremendous amount, although golf courses also probably contribute really heavily to emissions. I would love to see a study about like the comparison between like, yeah, it's only 3% of golf courses, but what percentage of, of the emissions? Because you know that they're out there mowing like every two or three days, right? And they're probably applying significant more, like a significant degree more of like pesticides and fertilizers to maintain the golf course than we apply to our homes. So just some interesting points to bring up there. The rest of that lawn is accounted for in things like public parks, fields, um, and other green spaces in like neighborhoods and communities. So why is the lawn so bad? Like lawns inherently aren't bad, but we do waste a significant degree of water because we're trying to maintain a lawn, particularly in hot, arid regions of the U.S., like out west, where lawns would not typically grow without human intervention, right? So we're having to give them a lot of time and care and water and probably fertilizer, which is contributing to a significant um, problems, ecological problems. And in areas where they're going through like regular drought, it's just not okay to be wasting water on growing a monoculture of grass. Just doesn't make sense at all. We also know, and you can find different stats um, about the, the sheer degree of emissions that we cause from gas-powered lawn care equipment. So this would include things like gas-powered lawn mowers, leaf blowers, which I hate leaf blowers so much, and then things like, like weed eaters or you know, sometimes weed whackers, people call them. We also see gas spills caused by traditional lawn care equipment, gas powered lawn care equipment. And this type of lawn also requires pesticides. Now, the irony of all of this is we have like government institutions and like societal institutions really saying that we have to maintain these types of lawns, right? Some people live in an area that has an HOA, a homeowners association, and you are not allowed to have anything but a monoculture of green grass, right? There are certain expectations that you will maintain that. And if you don't, then you can be fined for it, right? Or kicked out of your neighborhood for it. Other people have found themselves in hot water because they've tried to plant food in their front yard, right? To feed their family and they've gotten into trouble or the city has just come and ripped it all out, you know, when they were at work and they came home to just a dead zone in their front yard. This is not okay, right? Like we should be allowed to grow things in our landscape other than a monoculture of grass because it, it is so resource and input heavy and it's doing nothing for the ecology of, of where we live. So this is why the lawn, it's just not great. It's just not great for us to have. Now, for those of us who do have a little bit of lawn, like I said, you know, we, we have a lawn, but we are not maintaining it as a monoculture of grass. We have a lawn, but it's mostly moss. It's mostly clover. We have a significant degree of dandelions, which I'm not going to lie. Like our neighbors don't love. They've asked us when we're going to treat and we've told them we're not going to. We don't apply fertilizers. We don't apply pesticides. It's just not what we do. We live in a, a suburban neighborhood and it's, it's a great little suburban neighborhood, but it is, it, people are very meticulous about their landscape. Every last leaf gets picked up in the fall, whereas our yard is just like a carpet of oak leaves because we have big mature oak trees in the yard. There's other things that we can do though. So what can you do if you want to lessen the lawn, but you're not in a position to just go out and like get a sod cutter, remove everything, spend thousands of dollars to put in beautiful native plants. Here are some of the things that you can do. Again, pragmatic approach. You don't have to do everything all at once. You do what you can with what you have. Reduce the amount of lawn that you have. For us, that means each summer we're putting in a small like native plant garden. We put in two this year where we ripped out some non-native plants. We put in some native plants and then we made a, a new garden in one area of our yard. They're small spaces, but we did help remove some of that lawn and put really great native plants in it that can support wildlife. We also don't mow very frequently. Research, actually there, there's been research and research has shown that one, this is one study in particular, they mow the lawn at one week, two week and three week intervals. And what they found was at, at two week intervals, there was the highest, basically the highest individual numbers of bees that they found. So there were the most number of bees. But at three-week intervals, they found the highest biodiversity of bees. 
So in other words, they found the most different species of bees, but that paper kind of concluded that the two week interval was the sweet spot because they had the just the most individual bees at that mowing frequency. Quite frankly, we mow the lawn like once a month um, because most of our lawn is, is like low lying weeds, <laughs> what most people would consider weeds. It's a lot of clover. We also have a lot of moss in our yard, which I love because it's springy and it's soft and it re like requires zero maintenance, right? So learn to appreciate the weedier species of your lawn. Just think differently about the lawn. And then if you happen to have areas of bare soil, consider leaving those for some of our ground nesting bees and wasps and other insects. The one thing that I will say about leaving bare soil is if you have a very high trafficked area of your home, so let's say like near a sidewalk or where people are regularly coming into or out of the home or where kids are playing or you're gardening, it might not be the best idea to leave that bare soil because you don't necessarily want like wasps, you know, nesting in the ground in an area where like your kids or grandkids are just regularly playing and could stomp on that and disrupt the, the wasp and cause them to come out and sting. So depending on where that bare soil is, if it's in like an inconspicuous spot of your yard that, you know, isn't well traversed, leave it if you, if you so desire. But if it is like in a high traffic area, consider planting, hopefully not grass, hopefully some native plants that you can put in there um, and cover that up, which will deter things from nesting there. So less in the lawn. A lot of has to do with changing our own mindset about like, the, again, the societal expectation that we are to, to maintain just a, a monoculture of grass. Change your mindset, hopefully change the minds of your neighbor, um, neighbors and community. And, uh, and hopefully you won't get fined for having... <laughs> for having weeds in your landscape. So let's talk about planting native. I don't wanna spend a ton of time, much attention. I think it's placed again, just on planting native or just on planting for pollinators. And there are some other really great viable and simple activities that you can do at home that are just about you know, planting native. So first off, what is a native plant? Native plant is basically a plant that's been here for a really long time. Um, oftentimes we qualify native plant as native if it's been here since before European settlement. So usually it's a plant that's been here for hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region. These plants tend to support wildlife a lot better because wildlife have evolved with that particular plant species, um, especially for some of our um, insect specialists that can only host on or feed on very specific species of plants, when we remove that plant from the landscape, we lose out on all of those insect species because literally we've taken like their only food source. And the greatest example I think that we have in the insect world is of course the relationship between monarchs and milkweed, right? We take milkweed out, we lose the monarchs. We put milkweed back, we help support the monarchs. We do know that based on research, native plants support more biomass um, of insects and other creatures than non-native plants. Again, there's just this relationship aspect there. And so many people I used to work for the National Park Service and I was teaching people about invasive plants and people would say, well, why can't we just teach the deer how to eat garlic mustard? It doesn't work that way, right? Deer did not evolve to eat garlic mustard. It's just not part of their palate. Just, you know, we didn't evolve to eat tree bark as humans. We can't just teach the deer to eat something new. We can't just teach the insects to, you know, nectar on a new source or to host on, you know, something that they haven't evolved. Monarchs too have very specific mechanisms, the caterpillars, very specific mechanisms that allow them to even consume something like milkweed um, because it's so sticky. It, it literally glues mouths shut of other caterpillar species because they haven't evolved to like be able to digest those enzymes. So there's, there's very specific things here at play that we can't just ignore. So I like to talk about native plants in this, what I like to call that native plant spectrum. If you have ever joined something like a Facebook group about native plants, you might see a lot of demonization that happens um, around anything that is non-native or even native cultivars, which sometimes we call native ours. So this is an idea that I've been developing out. Again, it goes back to that pragmatic approach to conservation that I've, I've mentioned. So in this native plant spectrum, um, I posit that we have people who are very passive when it comes to native plants or even just conservation in general. They're very passive. They either don't know why it's important or they don't care that it's important. They're just kind of out there doing their own thing. 
On the opposite end of the native plant spectrum, we have the purists. We have people who are strongly believe we have to plant only native all the time, only straight species. So no native vars allowed, no native cultivars allowed. And if you're doing anything but this purist approach, you're not doing a good enough job. We have a lot of people who fall into that category. And then we have people like me and the work that I've done with PC are in, in the middle, right? I'm definitely not passive. Um, I'm definitely not a purist. I'm, I'm a pragmatic. The reason why I bring this up is because I don't ever want somebody to walk away from a native plant conversation thinking, oh my gosh, I am not doing enough. So I'm not going to do anything at all. I think this purist conversation has scared a lot of people away from conservation because they just feel like they're not, they're, they've been made to feel like that they're not doing enough. And because of that, they should just stop. They should just throw the towel in and they just shouldn't do anything. And I don't think that's okay. I think that we need to meet people where if you go to a big box retailer and you're looking for native plants, chances are you'll find some native plants, but they're probably going to be native cultivars, right? You can find a ton of different cultivars of black-eyed Susan or purple coneflower. They might not be the straight species, but planting that, that uh, cultivar of purple coneflower is better than you know going and planting Japanese barberry, which is considered invasive here in Ohio. So keep that in mind. It can be difficult to source native plants, although they're becoming more readily available. There's some great native plant nurseries here in Ohio that support them. Um, some people go as far as to say, not only do you have to plant the straight species of native, but you have to plant species that were propagated in this ecoregion. So don't you dare buy a purple coneflower straight species that was propagated in Minnesota, you know, do something that was here. That's that purest conversation that I just, I don't love. Um, but if and when you can find straight species that were propagated here, that's great. That's fantastic. If you want to go and you know do that extra leg of work and find those, that is wonderful. And those plants will certainly do great here. But we need to stop like the the bullying of people who you know choose to plant some some native ours. So which plants are best? A lot of people ask me like, which plants should I plant in your yard? It depends. It depends on your location. It depends on things like your soil health. Always do a soil test. Um, it depends on the drainage in your yard. We have very, very wet um, backyard. So it doesn't, a lot of like our prairie-ish plants don't do well because it's a lot of shade and a lot of wetness. How's the sunlight? Also consider your own investment and your resources. Do you have time to manage this? Do you have the energy? Do you have two young kids like me that just take a lot of time outside of your day job? Um, do you have the money to invest in something like, you know, a huge native plant garden? Because it can be, it can be a financial drain if you're going in and buying, especially like, you know, big, like gallon or two gallon or five gallon plants. It's a lot, um, but it's great. Prairie gardens have gotten a ton of attention recently. People call them pocket prairies or micro prairies. This is a, uh, the super bloom that happened a couple years ago out in, I can't remember the exact location, but it was out in like, I think the Dayton area. Um, and it was in a preserve, they had planted this and this was, I think year three, maybe, I mean, it was just beautiful. And it was in the media as like this big prairie super bloom. Not everybody can plant this at home and that's okay. Again, do what you can with the landscape that you have. And that's, that's great. You know, you will see benefits from just putting in a couple native plants in your yard. You will see the wildlife come, you'll see the hummingbirds, you'll see the insects, you'll see the butterflies come. Um, and it's incredible to be able to witness that. So plant for long bloom periods. You know, you want things blooming from early spring through late fall, if possible. Plant for different insect life cycles. So don't just plant things for adult butterflies to come nectar on, but also make sure you're including the host plants that those butterflies need to raise their young, right? The caterpillars. And oftentimes those are um, woody species like trees or shrubs and not necessarily our forbs or our perennials. Um, plant for varying habitats, of course, different insects and different creatures need different habitats. And then again, that mix of woody and herbaceous plants is going to be really important. We don't have a ton of time to show you this. Um, I am just going to bring this up really quickly, though. I'm going to do a new share and share my web browser here. So hopefully everybody can see this pollinator partnership site. These have wonderful native species guides and you can either type in your zip code. So here it would be 44691 for Worcester or you can just scroll down this list 
And there are two different plant lists for Ohio, depending on where you live. Um, they're both called the Eastern Broadleaf Forest, and one is the Oceanic Province. Down here in Worcester, I am in the Oceanic Province. This is a 24 page guide that kind of outlines wonderful native plant selections. I recommend just downloading this and keeping it on your computer. You'll see the map here, so I'm gonna zoom in. You'll see how Ohio is very, um, almost like equally just like divided right diagonally. So depending on how, those of you up in like Lake County, you're probably on the other one. You're probably on the continental province, whereas I'm down here in the oceanic. So you'll see where that region is. I love this guide so much again, because it, it qualifies native plants by their eco region. Um, Xerces also has some wonderful plant lists. Their guides are not as comprehensive and they also, they're, they're categorized more by like political boundaries, so like state lines. Some states are kind of divided, but they don't necessarily go by eco region like the pollinator partnership. But if you scroll through this guide here, it outlines some just wonderful plants and it talks about the woody plants, it talks about the trees, it talks about the shrubs, it talks about our herbaceous plants, so things like perennials. It talks about what, you know, what types of things are attracted to them, what types of soil do they need the sun. It talks about everything. Um, so this is a really, really handy guide. Again, it's not the end all be all, but it's a really, really handy guide. If you are just like, I, I don't know where to start. <laughs> you can start right there with that pollinator partnership guide. So you should now be seeing the PowerPoint again. We talked a little bit about native R, so I'm not going to go too much further into that because we have a couple other items here I wanted to talk about before we wrap up. I mentioned that I um, used to work for the National Park Service. I used to work in Cuyahoga Valley. I was the, my title was invasive plant communicator. People joke they would talk to invasive plants and ask them to leave. Um, in reality, I created an education and outreach program for park visitors to talk about why invasive plants are so detrimental to ecosystems. So an invasive plant is a plant that is both non-native and can establish on a lot of different sites. It grows quickly. It spreads to the point of disrupting plant communities um, or wildlife or just the ecosystem in general versus an introduced plant or a non-native plant, which is something that has been introduced to a new ecosystem, but it's not necessarily causing problems. And oftentimes things like introduced plants are not causing like uh, financial problems or damage. Oftentimes to our introduced plants are not necessarily plants that can grow without like human intervention. So like dandelions, for example, a lot of people consider them invasive. They're thriving in places like yards. They're not thriving in like woodlands. So I used to work for Cuyahoga Valley, the national park, Kathleen. So here in Ohio. So we have a number of different invasive plants here in Ohio. Most of these you've probably heard of before, garlic mustard, loose strife, or multi-floor rose. These are some, some that are causing significant problems in ecosystems. We also have some that are, have very commonly been for sale, things like Cal our Bradford pears. Bradford pears are so bad. Um, thankfully, as 2025, they will be illegal to propagate and sell here in Ohio. <laughs> Should have been a lot sooner than 2025. Um, we have barberry. We have things like Dame's Rocket. We have burning bush, our euonymus. All of our non-native honeysuckles and then our autumn and Russian olives. All of these are um, bad plants. <laughs> You should not be planting them at home. Um, in 2018, so fairly recently, we had 38 plants in Ohio that were declared officially invasive. And it said, um, this rule said, no person should sell, offer for sale, propagate, or distribute any of these plants. But again, calorie pear, Bradford pear was like the one on the list that we're like, we're not going to make this immediate. We're going to say, I think it's 2025, probably because landscapers have so readily planted these in neighborhoods neighborhoods across the nation, and they are causing such significant problems. And if you're interested in learning more about the history there, I'm happy to stay on and talk about it. Bradford pear, like the reason why Bradford pear became this kind of a fascinating story about plant cultivation, and it can go awry and what happens. So we have three more quick things I want to get through. One is leave the leaves. We talk about leave the leaves a lot with insect conservation because leaves provide overwintering habitat. They contribute to nutrient recycling. There's a lot of great nutrients like carbon um, held up in those leaves. Let them decompose in the landscape and contribute back to that soil health. 
They also create things like a, a moisture barrier for insects that need like our soil dwelling insects like fireflies, firefly larvae need soil. So leave the leaves is very important. Xerces has all sorts of information as does National Wildlife Federation, I believe has a whole like section of their website about the benefits of leaving leaves. Um, I have an article on my Chasing Bugs website too that you can sift through if you're interested. Flip the switch on light pollution. Light pollution is a contributing factor to the decline of species like fireflies and moths and a number of other nocturnal creatures. So what can we do to help this? Turn off your outdoor lights if you don't need them. If you happen to have a security light and you need that for security reasons, put it on a timer or a motion sensor um, so that it's only gonna turn on when needed or when there's a disruption in your landscape. One thing that people don't often think about too at night is drawing your blinds or curtains can help prevent your inside light from becoming outside light. And there, again, there's a lot of like scientific research um, about why and how light pollution contributes to the decline of insects. And some of it's fascinating. We know about fireflies because they, of course they use bioluminescence to communicate and lights can disrupt that natural communication. But with things like our aquatic dwelling insects, so this would include like damselflies and mayflies and caddisflies. They will actually, they will move under cover of night underwater because if they move during daylight, the sun is reflecting, even if it's you know super cloudy, that daylight is reflecting off of the surface of the water, making it really um, easy for fish to see their silhouettes as they sort of drift up or down stream. So for example, a lot of these creatures will stay um, connected to stream substrate, substrate like rocks or logs, they will disconnect themselves from that substrate. They'll float downstream. Um, in daylight, the fish beneath them can see their silhouettes floating down. So they, they will move during cover of night when the fish can't see their silhouettes. But when we have night, when we have light, excuse me, light in the night environment now reflecting off the surface of the water, it's doing the exact same thing that the sunlight does. It's creating that silhouette. So it's allowing fish to prey on them even when they typically wouldn't be preyed upon in a natural environment. I had the wonderful opportunity of traveling to the Great Smoky Mountains a couple of months ago to photograph fireflies. Um, this photo is of our synchronous fireflies down in the Smokies, which was wonderful. It's actually 150 photos stacked, about 90 minutes of shooting. And then here are what they call the paparazzi fireflies. Those aren't synchronous, but this is like 20 or 30 minutes of continuous shooting in the Great Smoky Mountains. You can see seeing those firefly populations are, we don't want to lose these. We don't want to lose things like this. So reducing pesticides again, because fireflies, um, their larvae are soil dwelling. The more we're putting chemicals into the soil, the less um, opportunities we're creating for these creatures to thrive. And then also reducing light pollution wherever possible will help them. Now, the final, final thing that I will talk about for like 30 seconds is pesticides. Homeowners apply more pesticide per hectare, per hectare. Um, to our home environments than farmers apply to crops. And at least farmers are giving us food for a growing global population. Homeowners applying pesticides for the sake of growing a monoculture of grass is not giving us much of anything, right? Other than a certain, I guess, aesthetic to our neighborhoods. <laughs> so consider that practice integrated pest management. If you're a gardener, if you're particularly interested in growing food um, or flowers or anything else, what is integrated pest management or IPM? It's basically a practice where we are using pesticides or chemical control last. And we are employing instead biological control, um, cultural and mechanical control before we ever have to get to chemicals. Um, so biological control, a great example would be like, you know, supporting predator, like, you know, predaceous insects like lady beetles before your aphids become a problem. It's creating that food web balance. Cultural could be things like through your practices, making sure that um, you're employing certain healthy practices and best management practices in the garden so that pests don't become a problem. Mechanical control, a great example would be something like picking off Japanese beetles rather than going out and just like spraying them. Um, again, it takes a little bit more time and effort, but it is much healthier for your garden. So, you know, in fact, I have to do I like to talk about integrated pest management through this like sort of four or five step process. So always inspect your landscape, um, scout for those pests, detect the issues, identify them early, 
If you need help from the experts on what to do, you can contact your local extension office and ask them if you need help with, you know, insect identification, or if you need help with like understanding, you know, a management plan for how to manage for pests. And then finally reflect on um, the best management plan and then correct the issue if you happen to have a significant issue that needs correction. So six simple things. I'm not suggesting that you have to go out today and create a plan and do all six of those things like here today. But if you can employ little things here and there, this fall, you know, we're getting into almost fall season, thank goodness, because I'm so sick of like sweltering heat this summer. As the leaves in your yard start to fall, can you maybe leave some of them? We actually rake all of ours up and we drag them to our backyard because our neighbors have made comments before. We drag all of our leaves to the backyard. We put them in a nice big compost pile. We don't, we don't mulch over them with a lawnmower um, in part because I hate mowing as much as possible, but also because if you're mowing over your leaves, you're also mowing over things like moth um, pupa or butterflies or anything else that could be pupating in there. And you're probably gonna destroy it by running it over with a, a lawnmower or a mulcher. So we just take everything intact and we, we take it to the backyard and there it sits until the next year. So employ little things, you know, try little things here and there, figure out what works for you. Just start small. <laughs> That's like the best advice that I could give. Start small, try to educate your neighbors. If you're so interested, it, it, like if you're so inclined, you can look for certification um, programs. Like we just certified our yard as the wildlife habitat uh, through National Wildlife Federation this year. We have a great big, beautiful sign in our yard. And some of our neighbors have stopped by and said, hey, what's that? Can you tell me more about it? So things like that can help um, alert other people to what you're doing and why, and that can be helpful. Yep, and as always, you can find out more at chasingbugs.com, but there's also like so many great resources like Xerces and National Wildlife Federation. Um, there's lots more to learn. Uh, uh, Entomological Society of America has some stuff, although that's more like science research oriented, but lots of, lots of good stuff out there where you can learn more.